All the evil ones who were cruel were bound in the place of judgment, but a tenth of them were let we let remain so that they might be subject to Satan upon the earth and the healing and the healing of all their illnesses together with their seductions we told to, we told Noah so that he might heal by means of herbs of the earth and Noah wrote everything in a book just as we taught him according to every kind of healing so check that out and so the evil spirits were restrained from following Noah and everything which he wrote and everything and he gave everything in which he wrote to Shem his oldest son because he loved them much more than all his sons now isn't that interesting right there they gave Noah information on healing with herbs but conversely when we read in the book of Enoch those wicked watchers gave those people the same thing but you see those people in this time attributed that information to the gods so they worship the gods for giving them the healing like they say uh you know this god is the goddess of healing as a matter of fact man the spirit is leading me to go check this out y'all this is deep check this out right here this is about the name jesus incidentally here it is right here and again this is in the back of the uh, scriptures right here this is a, dex, uh, a definition of jesus now check this out consider iosis i-e-s-o-u-s rendered as Jesus in the English version up to now. For an example, the authoritative Greek-English lexicon of Little and Scott under I-A-S-O, I-A-S-O, the Greek goddess of healing. Hmm. Check that out. So could this be that the goddess of healing is actually Jesus? When these gods came down, and that um, the name Jesus now, that could be one of the one of the one of the names, the modern names of this goddess of healing, which was taught to uh, our people way back in this day. Isn't that something? I'll read further. The Greek goddess of healings reveals that the name Ieso is Ieso or I I E S O, the Ionic dialect of the Greeks, Iusis, being the contracted genitive form. In David Kravitz's dictionary of Greek and Roman mythology, hmm. Greek and Roman mythology, huh? Greek and Roman god worship? We found a similar form, namely Iasus. I-A-S-U-S. There were four different Greek deities, gods, with the name of Iasus, one of them being the son of Rhea. Further, it is known that I-A-E-S is the abbreviated form of the name Iasus, and Dr. Bollinger in the Apocalypse page 396 says that this uh, three-letter word i-a-e-s was a part of the name bacchus bacchus is that fish god so now it all makes sense now that the christ you see these christians driving around with that fish symbol on the back of their car with the cross in the middle could that be where that came from bacchus the fish god who was iasis who was iusis the greek goddess of healing who was just another Egyptian god, who was another Babylonian god, who was another Sumerian god, who came from these gods, the origins of the gods. Y'all see where this is going? So you're calling on the name Jesus, man. They don't tell me who you're calling on. But when you call on the name of Yahoshua, salvation of Yah, hey, that goes from cover to cover. That's eternal, y'all. You can't change that. Just like my name is Moshe, people always say, oh, it's just translation. Jesus and Yahush was the same thing. Blasphemy. Check it out. Because Moshe is Moshe in Spanish. I mean, you could be watching something on the uh, foreign channel TV, and they could be blah, 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 blah. Jose Simpson. You'll hear that name, and you'll know that that's that person's name. So why would the, why would the son of Yah be any different? Why would the Mashiach be any different? You know, if it's Yahoshua in Hebrew, why I gotta be Jesus in English? You see how the lies being exposed now? We just read from the back right here and we cited several different sources. Do the research on your own, y'all, but I just wanted to bring that up. So again, that name Jesus, that ain't nothing but another God. Mm. Now, let's go to uh, Jasher chapter 7, verses 23, and let's read about the first God King, Mr. Nimrod. Yeah, Nimrod was something. He was the first to be worshipped as a god. God king. Man god king. They put a crown on his head. He unified the whole world. Nimrod was like, hey, this is my world. I own this. 
And it's funny because Nimrod was the first to establish a new world order. And that's the direction that we're moving in nowadays. You know, when the man of sin comes in, he's going to sit in Nimrod's seat. And he's going to crown himself as the God of all gods. But see, those who have eyes to see, the true children of Israel, we know that that's the time for us to get up and go. Because we know that's when Satan's going to be ousted out of the highest heavens. He ain't going to be able to ascend no more. And it's going to be trouble for the children of Israel. All right, let's read on. We're going to read in the seventh chapter of Joshua. We're going to read from verses 23 all the way to uh, verse 48. And then we're going to go ahead. And, and then after that, we'll jump to Joshua chapter 9. But first things first, we're going to go to Joshua chapter 7. And this is verses 23 through 48. And here we go. And Cush, the son of Ham, the son of Noah, took a wife in those days in his old age, and she bare him a son, and they called his name Nimrod, saying at the time the sons of men began to rebel and transgress against Shah. Here we go again. That same thing that's happening. And the child grew up, and his father loved him exceedingly, for he was the son of his old age. And the garments of skin which Yah made for Adam and Eve, his wife, Okay, yeah, 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 I'm sorry. And the garments of skin which Yah made for Adam and his wife when they went out of the garden were given to Cush. And after the death of Adam and his wife, the garments were given to Enoch, son of Jared. And when Enoch was taken up with Yah, or when Enoch died, because we know Enoch is not up, to, up in heaven right now, as is no man except Yahushua. Yahushua is the only person who walked as a man and ascended to the heavens and who is in heaven right now. He gave them to Methuselah, his son. Verse 26. And at the death of Methuselah, Noah took them and brought them into the ark. And when they, and they were with him until he went out of the ark. Verse 27. And in their going out, Ham stole those garments from Noah, his father. And he took them and hid them from his brothers. And Ham begat his firstborn Cush. And he gave his garments, to, he gave his garments in secret. And they were with Cush many days. Verse 29. And Cush also concealed them from his sons and brothers. And when Cush begat Nimrod, he gave those garments through his love for him, and Nimrod grew up. And when he was 20 years old, he put on those garments. So you see we have a passing of those garments. Now those garments held certain properties which allowed Nimrod, as we're going to read, as we're going to, read to, you know, Yah was with Nimrod also in those garments being that they were made by Yah and given to Adam and Eve, they possessed uh, certain properties which allowed Nimrod almost superhuman-like qualities. They allowed Nimrod to conquer his enemies. Let's see here. And, and Nimrod became strong when he put on those garments, and Yah gave him might and strength. And he was a mighty hunter in the earth. Yea, he was a mightier hunt. He was mighty hunter in the field, and he hunted the animals and built altars. And he offered upon them the animals before Yah. Verse 31. And Nimrod strengthened himself, and he rose up from amongst his brethren, and he fought the battles of, of his brethren against all their enemies round about. And the Most High Yah delivered all the enemies of his brethren in, the, in, in his hands, and Yah prospered him from time to time in his battles, and he reigned upon the earth. Verse 33. And therefore it became current in those days, when a man ushered forth those that he had trained up for battle, he would say to them, like Yah did to Nimrod, who was a mighty hunter in the earth, and who succeeded in the battles that prevailed against his brethren, that he delivered them from the hands of their enemies. So may Yah strengthen us and deliver us this day. So that became a saying, Nimrod was so great, they made a slogan after him. Verse 34. And when Nimrod was forty years old, at the time there was a war between his brethren and the children of Japheth, so that there were, so that they were in the power of their enemies. And Nimrod went forth at the time, and he assembled all the sons of Cush and their families, about four hundred and sixty men. And he hired also some of his friends and acquaintances, about eighty men, and being <clears throat> excuse me, and gave them their heir. And he went with them into battle, and there was about, I'm sorry. When he was on the road, Nimrod strengthened the hearts of the people that went in with him. And he said to them, Do not fear, neither be alarmed, for all your enemies will be delivered into your hands, and you may do with them as you please. Verse 37. And all the men that went were about five hundred and four, and they fought 
against their enemies, and they destroyed them and subdued them. And Nimrod placed standing officers, standing officers over them, in their respective places. That's interesting. Now, after this war with Nimrod, you don't really hear about the sons of Japhet, Japhet anymore. He draw, he basically drove them out of what we now know as the Middle East into what is now known as the Caucasus Mountain regions. And that way, he drove them up further up north. And you don't really hear about the sons of Japhet anymore. Verse 38. And he took some of their children as security. And they all, and they were all servants to Nimrod and, and to his brethren. And Nimrod and all the people that were with him turned homeward. Verse 39. And when Nimrod had joyfully returned from battle after having conquered his enemies, all his brethren together with those who knew him before assembled to make him king over them and they placed a regal crown upon his head and they set over his and he set over his subjects and people princes and judges and rulers as is the custom of amongst the kings and he placed Terah the son of Nahor the prince of his host and he dignified him and elevated him above all his princes Verse 42, And whilst he was reigning according to his heart desire, after having conquered all his enemies around, he advised with his counselors to build a city in, it, in his palace, and they did so. And so now we have Nimrod establishing his, uh, his rulership, his dominion right here. Verse 43, And they found a large valley opposite to the east, and they built him a large extensive city. And Nimrod called the name of that city, uh, he built Shinar. For the Most most High had vehemently shaken his enemies and destroyed them. And Nimrod dwelt in Shinar and reigned securely, and he fought against his enemies and subdued them. And he prospered in all his battles, and his kingdom became very great. And all nations and tongues heard of his fame, and they gathered themselves to him. And they bowed down to the earth, and they brought him offerings. And he became their master, or he became their lord and king and they dwelt with him in the city at Shinar and Nimrod reigned in the earth over all the sons of Noah and they were under his power and counsel so here we go right here in verse 45 it gets pretty interesting they turn they term him their lord it says he became their lord he became their master and king hmm ain't that something so they gave him godlike qualities it would seem he was worshipped as a god king, in fact. Interesting. Verse 46. And all the earth was of one tongue and words of union. But Nimrod did not go in the ways of the Most High. And he was more wicked than all the men that were before him. From the days of the flood unto those days. So here we go right here. Now we're starting to find out a little bit of something about Mr. Nimrod now. Check this out. They're starting to worship him as a god king. He's got his own kingdom. He's speaking words of union. Hmm. Hmm, excuse me. Who's that sound like? It sounds a lot like somebody we know these days. Or a lot like somebody we will get to know. That's the man of sin. Man of sin is going to come on the scene pretty soon. He's going he's gonna to speak words of union. And he's going to unite the world in an unholy matrimony. And he's going to announce himself to be the, the God of gods. And that's going to be when it's time to hit the road, Hebrew, Hebrew Israelites. Excuse me. Verse 47. And he made gods of wood and stone. And he bowed down to them. And he rebelled against the, the Most High Yah. And he taught all his subjects and the people of the earth his wicked ways. And Mardan his son was more wicked than his father. And everyone that heard of the acts of Mardan the son of Nimrod was said concerning him. From the wicked go forth wickedness. Therefore it became a proverb in the whole world saying, From the wicked go forth wickedness. And it is current in the words of the man from that day to this. Like they say the apple don't fall too far from the tree. Same thing. Same thing. Now it's interesting because we find out later when we keep on reading that Ter Terah is Abram's father who later becomes Abraham, our patriarch. And see, Abraham tests his father and tests his father's gods. We're going to read about that in a couple seconds. But it's interesting because, you know, Terah is a god worshiper, you know, and Abraham came from that. So brothers and sisters, even though we were in a dark at one point in time, you know, it's not impossible for us to come out of that dark and come into Yah's marvelous light, you know. And that's what the story of Abraham, man, it's a beautiful story once you read it and you have that understanding of it. Right now we're going to jump down to uh, Joshua chapter 9. 
we're wrapping up. We're gonna wrapping up here. After uh, after we read these, we're gonna go into a little bit of a description about these Anunnaki.